pieces is Emmanuel Gantz's uh, uh, phosphones, and we have a good uh, video of Mimi Girard's dance company performing to this. And uh, there's uh, some, uh, uh, not only did Gantz uh, get the groove system to make the music, but um, also to control the uh, light sources that was illuminating the dance company. The um, groove system uh, worked at Bell Labs in the um, um, late 1960s and continued on until the early 1980s when that computer was finally retired. And um, a number of uh, uh, composers would uh, come out to Bell Labs at night when we were not using the uh, computer for speech research, which is its other function. And um, Emmanuel Gant was one of these. Laurie Spiegel was another notable one. Um, Richard Boulanger came down from Boston. Um, and. Um, so um, a fair amount of interesting music was <coughs> made. Aboulez came out and tried it, and um, um, asked me uh, if I could use the kinds of techniques uh, to uh, control the uh, tempo of a tape recording so that um, if you had the accompaniment for a soloist on a tape, you could um, then uh, control the tape uh, to uh, maintain a good ensemble with the performer. And um, so I probably changed Boulez's, uh, my interpretation of Boulez's request to uh, uh, what I call the conductor program, which I'm still interested in, <coughs> and uh, the philosophy behind the conductor program was the uh, performer of a uh, computer-based instrument should be doing a job more similar to the uh, what the conductor of an orchestra does uh, than the way the uh, violinist uh, plays a violin. So in the conductor program, the um, score of the piece uh, to be played uh, was in the computer memory as a sequence. Um, eventually uh, MIDI files became the uh, preferred way of putting a score in the uh, computer program. And the job of the performer was to control the uh, expression of the uh, way in which the uh, score file was performed. Now, what are the expressive factors that could be controlled? Well, the tempo, of course, and the micro-tempos in the piece are one of the most important expressive factors. And um, in um, watching Boulez conduct, uh, Boulez, in my opinion, has a, a very uh, precise uh, motion of his uh, conductor's baton. And uh, so he uh, beats time uh, very uh, uh, in a very detailed and exact way, and he, uh, I believe, hopes the orchestra will follow his beat. Um, so um, I uh, uh, made the uh, rules of my conductor program uh, as closely as possible <coughs> do what I thought Boulez was doing. Another expressive function is the uh, dynamic, of course. Um, 
Still, another expressive function is the balance of the various voices in the ensemble that you have. Um, and still, another other expressive functions are the timbres uh, of the voices. And all of these things can be uh, controlled uh, with um, uh, the performers, the conductor's motions. Um, but um, one needs to be uh, very um, uh, careful about overloading the performer. He can only control so many things. And um, um, the way of um, uh, limiting what the conductor had to do at any one time uh, was essentially to write in the particular factors that needed to be emphasized in a given part of the uh, performance. For example, bring out the flute in this section and assign a, uh, a given controller to the flute for that particular section. And then later on, where the uh, oboe was the critical instrument to change the assignment of the limited number of controls. So the conductor program really um, divided the expressive quantities into those that would be written out in detail in the score and those which would be assigned to the human conductor. This then um, led me to an instrument which I've been working on since uh, uh, the middle 1980s. Um, the radio baton as a uh, controller and um, the um, idea of the radio baton was that um, there would be a controller that could sense the motions of the conductor's hands and uh, use that, those motions to uh, uh, control the uh, expressive quantities of the instrument. So um, initially I built uh, an instrument called the radio drum and um, this instrument uh, had a um, uh, set of uh, wires uh, in two dimensions, X going wires and uh, Y going wires uh, underneath a uh, plastic cover and when you would hit the plastic cover, that would cause one of the X wires to contact one of the Y wires. And uh, then you could tell uh, where you had hit the, uh, uh, this grid. And um, the instrument had a uh, contact microphone on the <coughs> back plate. And the strength of the pulse from the contact microphone could tell how hard you hit it. So you could then use where and how hard as uh, controls to uh, uh, control the whatever aspects of the music you wanted. I, uh, and this was a relatively easy instrument to build. I made one uh, for IRCOM, took it over to uh, uh, Paris and uh, one of the percussion players uh, that was at IRCOM, a very good percussion player, played a uh, I think the Bach Chacon with this and uh, Boulez listened and uh, pointed out a wrong note in the uh, uh, score and I was delighted to hear that because then I fixed the wrong note and it was forever okay. Um, but um, the instrument was overall not a uh, success. Uh, one of the problems was that um, the wires kept breaking at uh, points where they hit each other. And uh, another problem was that uh, you only got information from the instrument uh, when you hit it physically. Uh, but if you just waved the uh, uh, baton around above the instrument, or the drumstick in this case, uh, you didn't get any information. So uh, uh, when I got back to uh, Bell Labs, I um,
talked to one of my associates there, Bob Boy, and he thought uh, very long and hard about uh, making a, uh, a radio sensor that uh, could track the motions of a little radio transmitter in uh, space. At least he came around to this. He tried several other things before this. This has turned out to be the instrument that I've kept on working on for the uh, 19 years I was at uh, Stanford. And um, with it, um, um, I achieved not a full three-dimensional sensing, but at least at what I call a two-and-a-half-dimensional sensor. So um, the instrument uh, consists of a uh, 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 of this uh, radio receiving antenna, and um, if you were close enough to it, you could see that uh, from the pattern of the uh, metalization that there are four separate antennas on this plate. And uh, by comparing the signal strengths uh, received from a radio transmitter, here's the uh, current version of the uh, 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 stick. And if I remove the pad, you can see at the end of the stick there's a uh, metal ring, which is the transmitting antenna. And the, uh, so uh, the strength of the signal depends on how far you are from the uh, receiving antenna. I and uh, uh, Tom Oberheim, who's uh, joined me out here in California, I joined him, have been working on this device together for about a decade. I think uh, you and and I and probably everyone in the world has wondered about that because it was a very, very uh, fruitful environment. And uh, you have pointed your, put your finger right on the one of the great uh, uh, things about Bell Labs, that uh, we had experts in various fields in uh, the physics and chemistry and mathematics and um, um, and they all were willing to listen and talk to each other and spend enough time um, listening to understand the question that uh, someone from another field might have and uh, possibly if they got interested to actually uh, help that other person uh, solve the question. I. Um, had a, a number of mathematical questions come up that I was unable to deal with, and I was always able to find a mathematician who uh, often was able to advise me and sometimes uh, solve the problem for me. One of those exceptional mathematicians was named David Slepian. Uh, when I uh, changed to uh, a university job, I was uh, have been sort of disappointed that um, the interactions between uh, real experts in various fields are much more limited, and I don't understand why this is. I think one possible explanation is that. Um, um, the uh, support for the research department was, um, at least the research area at Bell Labs, came as a lump sum to uh, the uh, vice president in charge of research. And then he assigned various amounts of money to the various departments. And it was a very generous support so that no one really had to spend time writing proposals and, uh, uh, going out searching for money and competing with his associates. So maybe 
that certainly made people much more willing to to interact.